We are involved in studies in Acts, and our goal is we're looking at Acts with the purpose of discovering why the early church was so effective in changing their world, a world not too terribly different from our own. Uh, and so we wanted to see what made them successful and then what do we need to do to duplicate their results. Well, today we, we shift gears. We've been talking about conflict with the uh, outside world. Today we're going to take a look at the body life of the church and uh, some of the internal things that are, uh, that are happening there. And we're also going to see God's intervention into the first recorded sin in the church. So, let's read uh, a wonderful story. All the believers were one in heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. Uh, there were no needy persons. For uh, from time to time, those who owned uh, lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom uh, the disciples called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and uh, brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Great fear seized all who heard what happened. And then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what happened. Uh, Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for your land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look! The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear came <coughs> the whole church and all who heard about these events. Let's take it apart a little bit. Uh, first of all, the scripture says that they were all of one heart and one mind. Uh, again, this idea of one heart, one mind, means that they are just absolutely in, com in complete accord. In fact, they were so much in accord that this even extended towards their attitude towards their possession. You see what I mean? This, is, uh, uh, this has, takes such a, a broad thing in, uh, in that attitude. Uh, furthermore, uh, the scripture said that at Pentecost, they were unified and that they shared their possession. Well, the church has grown considerably since that time and um, uh, it has continued on. Um, and so what we find is that this attitude has continued with growth. It's been something about that early church that they were so much in one accord. They wanted about, it didn't make any difference whether they were rich or poor, wherever they came from, didn't make any difference, those kind of things, that they were so much in tune with the gospel 
and with Jesus and with what was going on that even their possessions were uh, part of. Now, uh, the scripture says that, that with that, the, test, the, the, the disciples were able to testify with great power about the resurrection. Now, there's something that we need to uh, focus on here and I think is important for us to look at in terms of our evangelism. We have come to a point where we tend to focus on the death of Jesus. And it's significant because it is his death, that sacrifice, that brought forgiveness of our sins. And so we spend a lot of time talking about the forgiveness of our sins and the death of Jesus and the sacrifice that brought that about. However, what we're finding here is that their focus was not on the death of Jesus, it was on the resurrection. And if you begin to think about it just a little bit, you begin to realize that it was the resurrection that gave, that made clear the effect and the purpose of the death. You know, without the, re without the resurrection, the death just probably becomes another tragic event in, in human history. But when you tie that death with the resurrection that comes from it, now all of a sudden we see that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God, uh, that that death was foreordained by God to bring forgiveness of sins and to bring with the resurrection new life. I want you to think about this for just a little bit. It's going to become important later on. Forgiveness is nice. But if we just keep getting forgiveness of our sins, just forgiven and forgiven and forgiven of the same old stuff, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really free us. What that resurrection does, what that resurrection teaches us, is that not only are we forgiven of our sins, but we are given a new life to where we can have victory over our sins. And so that we are not left uh, and just this, this constant morass and constantly feeling guilty and just up and down and in and out. The resurrection is the thing that brings uh, life to us. Uh, and it was this event, it was the resurrection actually that the, that, the, uh, that the disciples couldn't keep silent about. And especially if you're Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection and life after death and you're in control of the temple and these guys keep telling them that what you've been teaching is, is wrong, um, no doubt they, there's their reason for conflict there that's going on. Next is Barnabas. First of all, I want to, his name is Joseph, but his nickname is Barnabas. It means son of encouragement. Now, uh, it's what it is people tended to give. You know, when you have Peter, his real name um, uh, was uh, um, Phil. Anyhow, somebody help me. Cephas. Huh? Cephas. No, that's Hebrew for stone. Uh, Simon. His name was Simon. But Jesus called him Peter. Why was it? He was like a rock. He called him Rocky, is what he called him, you know? Uh, you know, and they did it to, to indicate, um, oh, uh, there was, Barnabas was of such a disposition that wherever he went, he encouraged people. Now, uh, later on in here, we're going to find out where this begins to play out. He's going to get sent to Antioch. They're hearing about all these people getting saved in Antioch. And they're going to send him. And the scripture says when they sent him there, and so he encouraged the church. You know? And he was one of those, uh, have you ever been around an up person? Huh? Seems like every time you get around him, you feel better. Huh? You just like to do that. Have you ever been around a down person? And, Cross the other side of the street when you're saying, "Oh, I don't." <laughs> you know, but but Barnabas was one of those great up people, and he was so much so that they called they called him Barney. <laughs> okay, for those of you, you know, I love you, you love me. 
purple dinosaur and all that kind of stuff. But, but, uh, but you can understand. Now, I, I think in one sense that says something to us about the kind of people we need to be. I, uh, we don't want to be a grouch. What people, when they come around us, they say, uh, it's doing good. Um, now, <clears throat> Barnabas, in this case, is a good example of giving. All it says about him is, he had a field, he sold it, he brought it in, and he laid the money at the apostles' feet. That was a good example. No pretense, no nothing, just brought it in and did it. Um, now, what happens here, Luke does introduce this future leader, and he will actually become a missionary companion of the Apostle Paul as we go on. But this is how he's introduced, as an upbeat guy who just made a significant offer. Okay? Now, on the other hand, we come to Ananias and Sapphira. They are given as a bad example of sharing. Okay? They love praise for their generosity and their love for money brought them in to where we have the first recorded sin in the church. This is the first one recorded. There may have been others, but this is the first one that's recorded in the New, in the New Testament. But notice what it was. Praise. They loved praise. Now in this case, praise for generosity. No doubt, uh, Barnabas got quite a few slaps on the back. You know, a lot of kudos for doing what he did. And they wanted that. And so they sold some property. But the love of money got to them. <coughs> what, what we find here, oh, I see that. They held back part of the price, and God smote them dead right on the spot. I find that terrifying, okay? And it becomes, I think it serves as a warning to us. God's still capable, okay? And, but I want you to notice, too, this really isn't unprecedented. If you go when they first built the tabernacle, uh, Aaron's son Nadab and Abihu brought strange fire in. God smote them dead, had fire on that. Uh, we go to Achan, they're just entering the Canaan land, and um, oh, uh, Achan uh, steals some of the stuff that was supposed to be left to God. Boom, uh, the family was stoned to death. And even Yuza, they're bringing the ark back to uh, Jerusalem and, they, and they're putting it on a cart instead of carrying it the way it is. Yuza reaches out to study, steady it and is smoked dead. So this idea of quick judgment and swift, severe judgment for doing those things that are clearly forbidden uh, is not unprecedented at all. Now, we started talking about, you kept back part, and they went on for a discussion there. You see, they, had the, they kept back the part, and they had the right to do whatever they wanted with, the, with what they chose. Paul says to them, or Peter says to them, look, the land was yours to do with what you want. After you sold it, the money was at your disposal to do whatever you wanted with it. There was nothing wrong in not giving all of the money. Nothing wrong at all. In fact, I guarantee you that uh, what they gave was probably a significant offering. And the church would have been thrilled to death. And there would have been honor went with it. The problem was that they represented it as the full price. They lied. That was the problem. They were hypocrites. 
in that they wanted to appear more generous than they really were, and they were liars in that they said one thing, but they did something else. But it's important to keep in mind that they had it under their control. It was at their disposal. Let me camp here for just a minute. We need to understand in our giving that what we have is at our disposal. Now, the Bible certainly teaches us that if we give 10% of our income, we will be blessed. Okay? But by that same token, it, it is very clear that we have a choice. Uh, if we want to give an offering, that is our choice. The money is at our disposal. We are not taxed in the church. We are not obligated in the church. This is voluntary. Now remember what happened here was there was such a unity among the people they had come together that it even spread to the fact that their possessions, they didn't consider them theirs, they considered them God's. And so we need to, some, I'm afraid that some of us carry um, an unnecessary burden when it comes to giving. Do you teach tithing? Yes, you've heard me do it. Uh, do you believe in giving an offering? Of course. But we need to understand that the blessing is there. Now, if you choose to do less or feel that you can only do less, that's between you and God. Okay? But by that same token, don't tell us that you're tithing when you're only given 5%. That makes sense? Do you see the lesson here? The personal lesson that we have? We have to do um, uh, what the Lord leads, uh, leads us to do. Now, but to make it appear that they'd given all when it was not, that was what was sinful. And that's what got them in trouble. Now, the next thing I want to comment on, um, I don't hear it so much now, but back uh, in my early years and when I was a teenager and whatever, and especially when there was a big push uh, back when we were flower children and hippies and living in communes, you know, uh, wore our hair down our back and put flowers in our hair and and tiptoed through the tulips. Honest, honest, my hair has never been much longer than what you see before I get a haircut. I, I did have a mustache. I shaved it off on the day I got married and haven't got had one since. But many of us sitting in here uh, probably can show us pic pictures of your ponytail. <laughs> okay. But what would happen is during that time, if you remember, there was this push to live in communes, where all of us took all of our goods and threw them all together, and we brought in, you know, it, we brought in everything we had and only used what we needed. <coughs> Every one of them was failed. Okay? And people were using this particular text to justify communal living. Well, the text is very plain. It is not communal living. Because Paul or Peter makes it clear that they owned their property. It was at their own disposal. They did what they did with it. Other scriptures talk about how they ate in their own homes. They shared, but it was not a communal uh, uh, arrangement. And so we need to understand that when we're talking about this here, this is not all of us just, you know, all just kind of getting together and whatever. The, the money that was brought in was very similar to what we do with the, uh, uh, with the compassionate ministries. The food is there for those who need it. Okay? That's what it's for. But all of, and, and while all of us contribute some, uh, uh, some may, may not contribute anything. doesn't make any difference. The point is, it is to help those who have a need. 
And that's what that money was for. It was to help those who had a need. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can we see what's going on? So it's important to keep that in mind. It's important to keep that in mind. I like this comment. A comparison with verse 4, which says, You have not lied to men, but to God, shows that the Holy Spirit is regarded as God Himself present with His people. That really struck me. When we start talking about being you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, and we push the idea of the Trinity, and, and well, we should, but remember, there is a unity there. Uh, you know, one, one God, three, and all that kind of stuff. And notice here that what they're seeing is, is the Holy Spirit is God's presence among them. And I got to thinking about that. You know, sometimes we, 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 we do that intuitively. When we come here and sing, and God moves and whatever, and we sense it. We sense His presence in the Holy Spirit. But this is God's presence presence among his people. I thought that was pretty good and something, when we begin talking about that in terms of evangelism, I think there's something to be said about when people come in, they sense God's presence among his people. Okay. <clears throat> now, they tested God's, the Spirit of God. And God smote him dead. Now, at first glance, that seems awfully severe, especially for me. Wow, <laughs> all you did was was tell a fib, and now you're you're dead. Well, a little reflection begins to tell us some things. Those dire consequences were really necessary. If God had let them get by, the first thing that the believers would have thought is that dishonesty would appear profitable. Well, they were dishonest, but look at all the glory they got. Look at how things were and, and you know, whatever. Dishonesty is profitable. God's not going to have that happen. The next thing that happened is, is that the spirit could be deceived. Now remember, Peter makes it clear. He says, you've not lied to men, but you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, in lying there, it would appear that the Holy Spirit could be deceived. Now, I can be deceived. I have been deceived. Okay? I have thought things that, uh, weren't, that uh, uh, people have made better or worse impressions on me than whatever, but not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, He knows. He knows. The second thing here, and I think there's an important thing about body life here, is that God will not tolerate hypocrisy and deceit. If you uh, read the Gospels carefully, Probably the thing that Jesus was the most hard on was hypocrisy. People who tried to appear to be something that they weren't. Uh, the word hypocrite uh, means a play actor. The Greek word play actor. It means to appear to be something you're not. Now, when I call our attention to that, I used to think, well, I'm no hypocrite or whatever, until I began realizing that I'm an adult child of an alcoholic. And as adult children of alcoholics, we tend to want to appear better than we are, to make our family appear healthier than it really is. And it was a real wake-up call for me to realize that if I'm going to get on with God, and if I am going to become a healthy person, 
I must be brutally honest, first of all with myself, and second of all with God. And thirdly, with everyone else. What you see is what you get. Well, I don't like that. I'm sorry, because that's the way it is. I, uh, you've got some bad habits. Yes, and so do you. <laughs> All right. Come on. But the key here is, when we start talking about when we have disagreements, when we make mistakes, sometimes we're out and out sin. One of the things that we have got to realize is that we've got to stand up, take responsibility for our actions, not blame anybody else, and be honest with what happens. Now, God's, God's given us a lesson here that makes it very, very plain. He's not going to tolerate it. He's not going to tolerate it. Scares me. And I'm not being funny when I say that. It scares me. Because I'm standing up here and I'm the one that is preaching the Word. And I'm going to tell you something. If I begin to play the hypocrite or become deceitful, I'm no better man than Ananias or Sapphira. Right? right? Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! I ought to scare the bejeebies out of us. <laughs> well, let's apply it to this lesson. What are we to learn that will make us effective in our mission? Now remember, this is the reason why we're doing it. We've talked about body life. And the application individually um, is certainly, you know, we've, we've done as we've gone along. But, how, what does this story tell us about being able to win the lost and dying that are out there? What does this story tell us about that? You see, when Peter's preaching and thousands are being saved, that's obvious. But now we're talking about body life and something that's internal. First of all, sin is not to be tolerated in our lives or in the church. I know this is a sticky subject. Part of the problem that we have with that is two different definitions of sin. Now, if you go into Romans, uh, you will find sin taught as a condition. When Adam fell, we were placed in a situation where there is something in us, something about us, that the image of God was marred. Okay? That is sin as a condition. But what we're talking about here, when we start talking about the holiness movement, we start talking about the sin we're talking about here, we're not talking about sin as a condition that sanctification eventually <coughs> cleanses and whatever it goes with that. What we're talking about here is a willful transgression of a known law. Good old John Wesley definition. Sin is a willful transgression of a known law. Ananias and Sapphira knew better. Now what's happened in our society is that we have come to the point that we don't talk about sin anymore. We just want to kind of scoot it under the rug. We just want to kind of dismiss it. And especially those of us who are Christians and have a reputation to, to protect. Yeah. Allie, did I just quit preaching and done gone to meddling? <laughs> Come on. But one of the things that has got to happen among us this lesson teaches us that personally and in the church, we are not to tolerate sin. 
Now, I, let, me, let me put some boundaries here. I'm not talking about these public embarrassments and stuff that were part of a, a generations behind us. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when someone has been confronted with their sin and they insist on continuing in their sin, that's when we have to take action as a church. That's what Matthew 18, 15 through 18 would teach us. Okay? We don't... We're not perfect. We're not perfect. And we're going to grow, and we've got those things. But! Have you ever thought about this line from the Lord's Prayer? When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you pray... Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right? Now what we're saying is, God, not only do I not want to sin, I don't even want to be tempted. I'm not going to put myself in a place where I'm going to be tempted. Lord, Lord, lead us not into temptation. But if I have to go there and it's your will, deliver us from the evil. See that heart that's there? I don't want to sin. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to do those things. Another very well-known public preacher was uh, accused this week of... Uh, Sexual impropriety by several women. I want to cry. I want to cry. And the problem was when those people who to whom he was to be accountable know about it, they blew it off. Until there became so many that the entire board resigned. The whole pastoral staff resigned because they stuck it under the rug. And now we're going to go through another time of the media is just going to have a heyday. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. There are several reasons why we are not as effective as the early church was. But one of them is, is we are too tolerant of sin. Okay? So, if we're going to be effective... One of the things we have to do is be brutally honest with ourselves and brutally honest with God. Yes, there is redemption. That's a whole other story. But it's time for the church to take back the ground that doesn't say it's a mistake, that doesn't call it humanity, that doesn't say, well, uh, it's open, that if that's what you think is right, it's okay. No, we're, there's a standard. And we need to do that. Amen. Second, God will expose deceit and hypocrisy in such a way that both believers and unbelievers will fear Him. And as I've said before, I don't want to be the bad example. Okay? But He will. He will. Mark it down. You show a church that's doing its best to be pure, doing its best to be holy, doing its best to follow the mission and do what God would have it to do, is full of love, full of unity, and, and uh, you let hypocrisy and deceit come in, watch out. God will, God will take you. I close with this. 
When sin in the church is exposed, it always damages efforts at evangelism. I, I'm not going to go on, it's, it's late, but all, I, you've all, most of you have heard me tell the story how I was early in my ministry when the Jimmy Baker scandal hit. And at that, I, and before that time, I, when I said I was a pastor, I was immediately given a lot of respect. After that, and never since then, when I mention that I'm a pastor, do I get respect. Okay? Damages. It does permanent damage. Well, <clears throat> there we are. Interesting, interesting lesson. You know, I think what we want to be is up people, right? Amen. We live open, and we are up people, in accord, living with God, watching the sin business. Uh, if it happens, it happens, but correct it, okay? I think that we will continue to talk about the resurrection of great power and great grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before